what we need to be, take care of are just a few things that are specific to AI. And I think that needs to be done at the, at the bottom level internationally yeah. and then leave the, the other regulations simply to the sectors and have AI experts per sector. Welcome to Tech Talks, hosted by myself, David Savage, and powered by Nash Squared. Welcome to today's Tech Talks on the show. We've got a couple of guests because we're now a month on from Web Summit. So we've got two of the interviews that we recorded at the conference. First with Tom Winterton, the head of platform at Invest Engine, and then Michelle Valstar, the founding CEO of Blue Sky AI. So Akish, no surprises guessing what we're going to be talking about there. No, no surprises. Um yeah, something to are you are you bored of talking about AI yet? Uh, not really, not really. I think uh, it, you know it, we, we've come to the end of this year, and I feel like next year it's going to take over a lot of uh, a lot of our our um, yeah, I guess podcast, but also quite keen and interested to see the use of AI because I'm sure with our guests, practical we'll, use, we'll, yeah, yeah, we'll have a lot of diverse uses, and um, I'm actually very very keen to see how people are using it um because Absolutely. it's amazing i've actually started using it a lot more recently as well um no okay so yeah if anyone receives an email and it's you know exceptionally written um it's it's not me it's uh... <laughs> oh, God. i think given everything we're talking about in the podcast yeah, I know. The minute about biases yeah. and being careful oh no it's, it's practice what me. you preach practice what i preach but also it, it's you know i'm using it with with still a human element because i'm still you know checking it and using parts good of it, you know good so yeah have it's a look not, at it, my linkedin post yeah and be aware of the dangers exactly exactly that but you know it, it is very useful uh, and it's it's no, more it is, ease it ease i think for me yeah I, I think i think you're doing it the right way right you're using it but then you're editing it you're yeah, not just correct lying. yeah exactly exactly, exactly. yeah um look yeah. We're talking there a little bit about what we've been talking about. We're going to do that in a bit more detail. We'll play the interviews. We've got loads in the show, so we won't mess around too much with us two at the start here. But later, we do have a voice note, as it's Friday, from Callan Warren Piper, who's one of the account managers at the PHA group. And he sent us um, a link to an article uh, in Semaphore, I believe. Let me just double check. Yep. Yeah, Semaphore Signals, yep. about what the world wanted to know in 2023, basically revealed by Google Search. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. First, hand over to Tom. So I'm chatting to Tom. Uh, Tom, thank you for spending some time. How, well, well, this is Wednesday. I had to think about that for a second. Uh, you are here exhibiting for Invest Engine. Have you exhibited already or is that today or tomorrow? We, we did. We exhibited yesterday. I should first of all say, I suppose, to Dwayne because we're in, in Lisbon, obviously, and it's, oh, yeah. it's great. Thanks for having me <laughs> on the, on the um, podcast. Yeah, we exhibited all day yesterday. I, I'm thoroughly exhausted. I, I said for <laughs> slightly hoarse, I think, from, from doing my elevator pitch to uh, potential investors and potential partners and strategic partners. So we had some really exciting conversations yesterday, yeah. but it was a long day. So um, when I now ask you who are Invest Engine, after yesterday's practice, this should be thoroughly slick. Oh, yeah. I mean, I have to uh, <laughs> run through. So Invest Engine, yeah, we were a UK based um, retail investment platform. Mm -hmm. We specialise in ETFs. And for those of you who might not know, ETF stands for Exchange Traded Funds. Yep. And we really think that those are the best instruments for most people to be invested in. They are super low cost and they give people exposure to a wide range of stocks and shares. So we really think ETFs are the perfect vehicle for retail investors. Mm -hmm. And our sort of platform is the only one completely dedicated to ETFs in the UK. And we're really trying to champion them and get the word out because we think it's a really uh, important thing for everyday people to know and sort of demystify uh, wealth management and investing. So this podcast has a bit of a split personality audience. There are a large cohort of people who listen who are technology leaders and very unkindly, anyone who's listening over the age of 35, sorry, but veterans, and that includes me. Uh, and then there's kind of 18 to 29 year olds. I imagine that some of those veterans know what you're talking about. 
I am not one of them, and some of those people in that younger category are probably going, hang on a minute, Does, is this applicable to me? Who is your audience? Who are your customers? And what do we really mean when we're talking about uh, you know, exchange funded trades and so on? Yeah, well, uh, there's a really good message here because actually if you are in that younger sort of um, bracket, it's great to learn about ETFs and investing now because if you start now, you're going to be so well set up for, your, if for the future. So, um, and, and maybe if you're in the older sort of uh, veterans category, <laughs> you're maybe wishing that ETFs were around when you were in your sort of 20s and you started your investing journey there. Yeah. So, um, simply put, I, an ETF is, is an instrument, it's a fund, which is, you know, you have a fund manager who looks after it, and ETFs are focused around buying an index. So, one of the most popular ones out there is the S&P 500. That is the 500 largest companies in America. Yep. And the ETFs that track the S&P 500 buy all of them within the fund. Mm -hmm. So if you buy part of the ETF, you own a bit of every one of those 500 uh, companies. So a really great example. We had lots of people, especially during COVID, who really got into trading. Oh, and you here got to buy Tesla, got to buy Apple. If you buy an ETF, you will have a bit of Tesla and a bit of Apple, and it will be all together with the other 500 biggest companies in the US diversified and it's been shown to be one of the most cost effective ways to invest over the long term. So it's low risk and low barrier of entry? Well we're trying to lower that barrier of yeah. entry. I, mean, I should say on the risk, uh, this is investing in companies so everything can go up and down. You of course, to, you need to but invest I suppose by spread, spreading that Absolutely. risk. Absolutely, <clears throat> far far more sensible than investing in a single company. Yeah. And on the barrier of entry, uh, traditionally it has been if you go back to probably pre-internet sort of um, days in, you know, in the 90s, people would have a stockbroker that they would call up and, and sort of call up and place a trade, and they'd be paying you know, 12, uh, 15 pounds to do each trade. But even now, actually, with some of the online brokering pra platforms, you will still, in the UK and, and Europe especially, you will still pay trading commissions to buy a share. And we think that creates a big barrier. There's also lots of jargon and people don't really know where to start. Mm. So that's sort of Invest Engine's, part of Invest Engine's mission. I don't want to use sort of grand terms like democratizing investing, but that, I suppose that's really what we're doing. We're trying to make it accessible to everybody and really keep those fees down because those fees over a 20 year period, if you're saving for your retirement or, or the future, can really eat into your returns. So what Invest Engine does, it's, it's, it's an app and it's a, a website which hopefully takes you through a simplified way to have a sensible portfolio of investments. We, we don't, you don't need to know a share price or, or, or you know, how many units of shares a company trades in. We let you set percentages for your portfolio. So you yep. can say, I want to invest 20% in America, 10% in the UK and set weightings based on a percent. And then you simply say, oh, I want to you know, start investing for maybe as little as £20 uh, a month or a week. And we help you automate those processes. So we um, have spent a lot of time using the latest open banking technology. In the UK, we have something called variable recurring payments, where you mm -hmm. can just link to your bank account and you know, just time things so it lines up with your salary. As soon as you get paid, you, you put a bit of that money into an investment portfolio. And uh, it's invested into really well diversified funds, which have been shown if you do that over time, you will build that investment portfolio, which is super efficient. Increasingly, people do want to put their money into to companies and causes that they believe in, values that reflect them. Is there, and look, I, this might be a really silly question, but is there a slight concern that if you're investing in lots of companies at once, you kind of remove the ability to support companies that you would feel aligned super to? Super interesting point. So. I mean, ESG investing has been a huge theme over the last sort of five years, and not without its controversies. There's all sorts of greenwashing, and all sorts of sort of pieces of companies look to sort of get that ESG sort of stamp of approval. ETFs is exactly the same as all the other companies invested. They have ESG sort of specific um, funds, which are sort of vetted for companies that meet certain standards. And there's a wide range of, of, of options out there. I mean, I think it's fair to say one thing that investments across the board um, are struggling with is there's no universally recognized standard for 
you know, what that uh, ESG criteria is. And, and as you mentioned, people might have different different sort of political or like religious beliefs, and, mm -hmm. and certainly that's the case. I mean, we've got on our platform, for example, several um, funds which um, work within sort of Muslim principles of investing, and you know, without sort of um, interest and and the like. So there, there are certain ETFs which are focused to those communities. There are certain ETFs which are ESG sort of filtered, so you're not investing in the gas and oil and mm -hmm. those sorts of companies. And there are actually really thematic specific ETFs. If you think that, hey, um, clean energy or, or whatever it might be is the place to put your money because that's where you're going to see the growth and for the greater good of the, the world, I suppose, yeah. you, can, you can pick a fund which is tracking an index which just invests in say wind energy companies or, or whatever it might be there are lots and lots of options um, through this ETF structure which still has that diversification but lets you focus your investments and so yeah it's a fantastic sort of vehicle to invest regardless of how you know the strategy you want to take. We're going through a bit of a cost of living crisis in the UK at the moment how how do you try and encourage people that this is a good use of their money when perhaps household, household budgets are feeling stretched? You know what, I've noticed that, Ian, buying the cup of coffee in the morning and, and the, the Tesco shop, certainly. I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's tough for everyone out there to put a bit about you know, mortgages going up and the like. But I think the, the bit you've got to think about for investing is you are, it, it is all about you know, that financial planning and responsibility and actually... Mm you know, st do, putting something away regularly, even if it's a small amount, and especially those those sort of those people in their sort of twenties, actually, really small investments early on in your twenties, they they compound over the years, and they really makes a big difference. So, the thing I would say on investing, it's sort of s small and often is often more important than than it. So. Uh, it's really important for people if they can put a little bit away to build that that safety pot. Yeah. And actually, you know, it's um, they, you know, it's the rainy day fund is really important for people as well. So I'd really encourage people to have that pot of money there just in case you you, you lose your job and stuff. I think it's yeah. it's very important at this sort of time. You're a tech business. Um, it's an incredibly noisy market out there at the moment. Um, huge amounts to to. Well, a lot of different challenges, I suppose, a variety of challenges that, that businesses are facing. Where, where is your attention right now as, as, a, as a business? Where are Invest Engine trying to make sure that you're, you're focused and that you continue to grow and to provide that service to your, to your customers? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think it really comes at home when you're in a place like Web Summit where there are 70,000 people here all with connections to really exciting businesses. I feel like we should have had AI in our title uh, because that seems to be a big theme this <laughs> well, year. Well, I don't know. It probably, I, I was actually thinking it's a good thing that you don't because it makes you stand out. There are so many who do. Possibly. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, in terms of um, you know, what our focus is, obviously we are a platform for long-term investing and we're continuing to grow. We've, we're at, I, I want to say, 32,000 customers mm. now and um, probably 270 million of assets under management, and we're, we're growing at 10% sort of a month, that sort of territory. And we, it, our business is, is built on scale, so we need to continue to grow. So part of our, our sort of mission here is to get the word out yep. and to have great conversations with um, people like yourself and obviously spreading the word of Invest Engine. I should do my plug here. If you haven't downloaded <laughs> our app, you can try us out for free. You can look at the ETFs. iOS and Android? Of course, yeah. of course, and a web app, because I'm one ah. of those guys where, you know, if I'm going through my financial plans, I like to sit down at uh, my sort of desktop and sort of plan it out. So we've got all those, so check us out for sure. So, yeah, one thing's spreading the word, and uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're also, we'll be raising um, the next round of funds for the next year, and so we're having sort of discussions with investors. And, and, and the third, third point of us being at Web Summit and what we're trying to do is, is look for sort of strategic partners and, and how we can work with some of these other really cool tech companies. Yeah. So there's a real fintech ecosystem, um, and it's really important that we engage with them because... You know, customers want uh, very simplest open banking to be really seamless, and there's lots more we want to do with open banking. We, yeah. We've done. I think we're 
I would say we're one of the um, top companies in the UK in sort of really using open banking payments, but I've got so much ambition on what we want to do here. And we need that ecosystem of fintech partners to support us in, in that. And so it's really great making those connections and talking tech with people. And I, I'm the one on our stand where, you know, if, if we need the geeky conversations, they usually bring me in. And then my sort of uh, some of the guys have to sort of drag me away when I start to put people to sleep talking about APIs and all that. <laughs> so one final question before we, we uh, wrap up. Um, you said there that you're kind of the geeky one that gets brought into the conversations. What questions do you have? What, you know, when you're walking around this conference, as you now can, now that you're not tied to your stand, what are you looking at and going, oh, I, I wonder what's going on here? You know, I, I'm just uh, I'm just absorbing everything. It's really the innovation going on here is fantastic. So, I'm really geeky into the AI stuff. And selfishly, how can I automate my workflow? So, <laughs> I love my job, but there are certain bits of my job I, you know, I would be fine being automated. So, I'm definitely. And my partners sort of ask me, what you know. Get me some AI tools that I can use to automate this bit of my job. So selfishly, I'm looking for those AI tools which are going to be automate the boring bits of my job that I don't want to do. Yeah. And then just generally the infrastructure and um, so what exciting companies are out there. I mean, we've got obviously ambitions to look at new markets in the future. So it's good to understand, you know, uh, what are investment firms doing in Germany, for example. Mm. We've got lots of our inspiration from savings plans which have proved hugely popular in Germany which let people invest in ETFs and we've done a similar thing in the UK and so you know shared learnings and shared experiences across companies are really important so I'm, I'm just trying to absorb everything from the conference to be honest and take it all in. Well look I really appreciate you giving up some time and having a conversation and enjoy the rest of your time in Lisbon. Great to speak to you David thank you. As I said we've got two interviews so first you heard from Tom and now we're going to hand over to Michelle. I'm shouting to Michelle. Uh, we're in an empty press conference room. This feels slightly overbaked for uh, two people having a chat on a podcast. But it's lovely of you to take some time out of your schedule and to, to talk to me. No problem. Thank you very much, David, for having me today. Uh, and you're the CEO of Blue Sky AI. Correct, yes. Who Founding are Blue Sky CEO. AI? We're a spin out from the University of Nottingham that takes face and voice analysis. Mm -hmm and brings that to the medically relevant market. So we're operating with pharmaceutical companies, doing face analysis that makes what used to be subjective measures of, let's say, dementia or ADHD or pain, mm -hmm. and we're making those objectively measurable. And funnily enough, uh, f or over a year now, we're also deploying that in the automotive industry. Oh, really? Which basically gets most people questioning, well, like, why? And this is basically because most automotive cars are looking to the future in, where, in which people will be using their cars in a very different way, mm. far more automated driving, far more time in the car to do different things, bring added value, added benefits to the occupant of the car, mm -hmm. And that includes me measuring their health and their well-being, either to give them a more pleasant ride, so basically just a, uh, an immediate benefit, but also really to do early detection of certain medical conditions such as dementia. Yeah. University of Nottingham is a, certainly a well-known institution when it comes to medicine and, um, you know, I, I, for instance, a lot of would-be medics will go and study at Nottingham. Correct. Yes. Um, what does that invite? What has that environment given you as a startup um, and, and as a leader of, of, of a startup business? Well, at first, it gave me my existing extended network. I was a successful academic, working with the medical school regularly, the school of psychiatry regularly. The, there's an institute of mental health there, national institute. Um, so there was lots of existing collaborations, you know, that, where we could test our ideas, check out what the, the unmet need was for patients and, and the population. And that's what I thought was the benefit. You know, and of course my tech team, uh, we've been drawing from uh, alumni, uh, well, uh, my ex-students, etc., for some time. But what I didn't realize is that 
the University of Nottingham is also an incredibly large university, yeah. very mm -hmm. big. Um, and you just meet alumni everywhere, right? Uh, it, it, literally almost every business meeting in the UK that I go to, any, any dinner, there'll be one or two alumni from Nottingham. And, you know, you just have that extra connection to begin with that helps you, um, uh, you know, get, get far, you, you accelerates your working with them. So what, what are you able to do with the technology at the moment? Because there is a huge amount of chatter out here about AI. Yes. Yeah, Web Summit, AI in particular, is like the of buzzword course. everywhere. But what does it mean with regards to how we can help people from a health standpoint and, sure. and how are you applying it? So what we do is we first look at facial muscle actions. Mm -hmm. So these are uh, the actual muscles in your face that you pull that make visible changes to your appearance. Mm -hmm. um, we look at your social gaze, where are you looking, what are you doing? Um, we look at the tone of voice, your head actions. So these are, we we'll call those behavior primitives. And we use computer vision for that, uh, machine learning, uh, the usual, in a sense, uh, we're a uh, full-stack company. We have all the IP is our own. Yeah. Um, man, much of it is patented. Some of it is unpatentable, but just trade secrets, etc. Um, and but this computer vision and audio analysis then gives you these behavior primitives. Yeah. And from that, that's only about 200 parameters. Yeah. And from that, we then learn the behavior insights, which is like a, a depression recognition indicator or similar. So coming back to that point about the environment, you, you've got something where you're using quite new techniques to something that I suppose previously was very academic. Yeah. How useful has it been, or has there been much resistance even from the academic community around some of these, no. some of the application of the technology? No, there's no, there's no resistance in, in general. There is, there is a lot of um, talk and a lot of conversation about ethics and how to do this appropriately. Which is a good thing. It's a good thing. Um, actually, as a community, the effective computer community, we took uh, steps really quite a long time ago, at least uh, eight years ago, six years ago, we started having conferences just on that topic mm. uh, or having uh, panels just on that topic at our main conferences. So this was something that, that we, in that sense, were quite well prepared for. Mm. So any, f any pushback really comes from sometimes the medical uh, profession. Yeah. Um, where they either think it's impossible to measure these things, mm -hmm. that's, that's, but that's, in a sense, easily countered by our clinical trials. Yeah. Um, but then there's also the, what do you do with this, right? So there is the, um, do we really want, uh, uh, should, should, should we be worried about warning people, giving them, letting them know that they have depression, for example? Yeah. Or should a clinician always be involved or is it okay for uh, a, a, a user, a patient, to just have that information to themselves? So those are the kinds of hard questions that we engage with with that community. I suppose the reason I ask that is there's, there's certainly from the technology leadership standpoint, there's a concern that there needs to be more regulation, but they're not sure that regulation will be effective. But it might be that in a, on a small scale, you're kind of working out how those relationships should, should look like between different aspects to make sure, yeah, here's, here's the technology, we can take it forward, we can give people the benefits that it unlocks, but it has a sensitivity around ethics and, and those, those concerns. Yes. Not much of what we're doing is new when it comes to ethics and regulation, right? Ethics is, in a sense, a framework within which you operate yeah you know you've got ethics which is your rules and your values which is sort of your your local environment and together they help you make decisions about what is right and wrong what can you do what shouldn't you do yeah um the regulatory framework as it's being developed at the moment um i'm very much in favor of the regulatory framework uh remaining very much use case specific so mm. having the regulation with the department for transportation with the department for health rather than having a sort of a top-level regulatory body that is an AI uh, regulatory body. Because 
they don't have the sector expertise that you need. And ultimately, more often than not, it's a sector-based decision, and it's not really an AI-based decision. Any, there's many systems that, that make mistakes. AI is not, not different in that sense, right? So you, we know how to measure error rates, false positives, um, sensitivity, etc. cetera. Um, what we need to be, take care of are just a few things that are specific to AI. And I think that needs to be done at, a, at the bottom level internationally yeah. and then leave the, the other regulations simply to the sectors and have AI experts per sector. Let's put some of those challenges to one side for a second then and, and just to, to finish on. What should people be excited about? You know, the area that you're working in does have potentially huge benefits. It, okay, uh, there, in perinatal mental health, which is going to be our first mental health product, yep. it's now going through clinical trials, about 30% of pregnant women and new mothers have serious mental health issues. If we can bring that down to 20% or 15%, right, halving that, we're talking so many millions of people around the world that will not, will just have a better life, yeah. right? Their children will have a better life. Their partners will have a better life. And that's not even talking about the burden on our eco economy and on our health system. I think the opportunity here is absolutely enormous, but we have to make sure that we empower people to look after themselves yeah. and help themselves understand themselves better. Well, look, it's been a pleasure to speak to you. I know that uh, I've pulled you away from your from your platform where you're talking probably to would-be customers, potentially investors. It's, it's, a, it's a real kind of melting pot here. So good luck for the rest of your time in Lisbon, uh, and thanks for your time. Thank you very much, David. Hi, I'm Callum, and uh, I think tech professionals should be aware of an article by Semaphore uh, called What the World Wanted to Know in 2023, as revealed by Google search. I think it's valuable because, you know, at this time, people are uh, consistently looking for predictions for the year ahead, but um, seldom there's a lot of uh, reflection. And I think uh, this kind of article does a good job of looking through what we've been looking at um, and the kind of trends, themes, and uh, big news points during the year. And obviously, <clears throat> Semaphore is an up and coming publication in, in the UK. Um, have a big base in the US, but uh, but yeah, they put a lot of great effort into their reporting, and uh, yeah, a, a good one to read. Right, Akish, um, yes. we said in the intro to the show that we're going to be talking about what the world wanted to know in 2023. We said, are we sick to death of talking about AI yet? Funnily enough, AI didn't come up in the search party. Mm. Um, I, I, I Look, first thing that jumped out to me, the search illustrates the global music industry is becoming less US centric. The top trending song this year was Idol, but in Japanese. So mm. if if I didn't know it was Idol, I wouldn't have had a bloody clue. I, th I thought that was quite interesting. That was yeah, it massively because you you think music, you think you know um, the US and and all the rich and UK. Industry. We're we're, and UK, we're biased yeah. towards yeah. Um, we are. Western. We are. We are. But but also, I, I just thought it was. Um, yeah, like I mean, I didn't even know what that song was to be honest, but um, definitely added to the uh, Google list uh, by, by searching for <laughs> Does it. Does that again. show that, that we're we're getting old? Or uh, I mean, it probably biased, probably, probably means I'm not, I'm not you know I, in in terms of my musical taste, it probably just means that I'm I'm into what I'm into and you know don't really know anything else really. So have you made the switch from from Radio One to Radio Two? <laughs> no, not yet. No, no, but I do I do dabble in Radio Five. Um, which I think. Oh, I'm, mate! Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. You know, I love a bit of Radio Five. I got, I got to say, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Um, very good. You, you, you feel like you're you're eavesdropping a conversation at a pub or something, aren't you? Um, when you listen to Radio Five, it's just absolutely. To anyone yeah. who's not in Britain, by the way, this is going to make no sense. Yeah. We're talking about BBC <laughs> radio stations. Yeah. Radio One, yeah. cool, trendy new music. Radio Two for everyone who's a little bit older. Radio yeah. Five, news and sport. Yeah, yeah, yeah discussions uh yeah. discussions <laughs> exactly yeah. not yeah. but not radio floor which is highbrow discussions mm. yeah no that's i haven't made it to that point yet, but anyway yeah <laughs> uh, but but what, what um, i did what i did think was um one thing actually on from that article mm -hmm. was um people you know research i think the most one was the the, the sort of war with israel and palestine yeah. and gaza that sort of thing so i thought you know what 
when we talk about people educating themselves or i mean i don't know right i mean what those searches or what precedent under what precedent those searches were were taken but i i it, have it, it to kind admit, of i, I goes, have been like, I don't know about you, right? I, I have been really cautious to believe anything that correct. I see specifically on social correct. around this. Yeah. yeah. Because as we're talking about with, you know, at the beginning, joking around about um, AI and its mm. biases and whatnot, mm. you're aware that there are deep fakes. You're aware that stuff can be taken out of context. Yeah. There are quotes put on stories, both sides. And I just, I have so little reference point of knowing what I'm looking at as being. Um, verified and mm. real it's it's a minefield so mm. i don't know maybe, maybe it's a good thing that people are searching on google and yeah. maybe trying to find trusted news sources and yeah. not just relying on social i don't know whether that's something that i feel slightly heartened by mm. i think um i think i think more so it's uh, the, the one thing that jumped out to me was you know the the validity of news reports and articles mm. and blogs and people and and just to think that like you know it could be anyone googling from you know going on their commute home to someone actually sitting there conducting their own research yeah. or their own sort of you know analysis on things and that's why it goes back to our point which i think we made a few weeks back around you know being super careful and regulated in terms of what we're putting out because Anything that we put out can drive political views, religious views, that sort of thing, and then that, yeah, you know, that can transcend into God knows what. Um, so yeah. I, I, th I think the the biggest thing, you know, without putting a, a dampener on the, the the pod or something, but I think for me it was like, you know, there are people mm. wanting and researching this on a daily basis for whatever reason. Yeah. So that's why we just need to make sure, or, or I would love that it was a bit more regulated rather than any Tom, Dick, and Harry putting their own views. However, uh, the top search ahead of all of that was Titanic Submarine. Mm. Uh, the that. fate of five daring millionaires. Mm. Um, more than the migrant crisis, more than anything else that's going on. I mean, I don't know what this says. There, there is a link to an article on this. Um, uh, when rich and privileged people run into trouble or behave badly and get caught, we feel better, mm. psychologist Pamela B. Rutledge wrote in Psychology Today. I don't know how I feel about that, to be perfectly honest. Um, yeah. I, don't, I don't... I'm trying to think. Did I... I think I might have Googled about I, it at the time, I, actually. I, I think yeah. I might have contributed to this. To this. I, I have definitely contributed to it more than once because I was just so fascinated to see... And, what the hell's happened? Yeah, like what the hell's happened? How did it happen? And also, um, yeah, you know, just like in terms of why or, or whose idea was it? And then... You know, definitely Googled the uh, the company and all that sort of stuff. But, yeah, um, yeah, crazy, but, you know. There we go. So, look, Callum, thank you for pointing us in the direction of that. We'll put a link to the show notes. Oh, sorry, link in the show notes, rather. Uh, we'll be back next week. Um, Akish, have a lovely weekend. You too. Tech Talks is hosted and edited by David Savage. It is produced by Nash Squared. And we have special thanks to Lemzy for supplying music to this show. <laughs>